just going to briefly introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, Dr. Riaz is a clinical associate professor at the Dean McGee Institute uh, at the University of Oklahoma. His clinical and surgical practices focus on cornea, external disease, anterior segment, cataract, and refractive surgery. Uh, he was awarded Best Teacher in 2018 by the University of Chicago residents, and again in 2019 by uh, residents from all six Chicago area residency programs. Um, he has authored more than 45 publications and done 60 presentations at national and international conferences, uh, been an invited lecturer, wet lab instructor at conferences, uh, visiting professor, both in the U.S. and internationally. He also serves on the ASCRS Young Eye Surgeons Com Clinical Committee. Um, and this year, he was the first ophthalmologist to be awarded the Esculapian Teaching Award from the Oklahoma University College of Medicine. Um, Dr. Rias has a passion for resident and fellow education, um, teaches national board review courses. Uh, he, and, he and his wife, Sana, who is also a physician, are blessed with three amazing children. And without any further ado, you can go ahead, Dr. Rias. Okay. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kamran Riaz, and I thank uh, Michael for that uh, needlessly long uh, introduction. It's a pleasure and honor to, to be here with you all tonight and talk about something that we as corneal surgeons uh, probably encounter very frequently in our practice, and which is cataract surgery in the patient with corneal uh, disease. And oftentimes, um, either uh, doing the cataract surgery at the same time of doing a corneal procedure or in patients with stable corneal disease. There's been a lot of uh, recent developments and um, innovations in this field, especially in measurement of corneal power with biometry and various Iowa formulas. And so what I wanted to do is to try to uh, review some of those developments, including something that just actually literally happened today, uh, and also talk about three commonly encountered scenarios that we may encounter in our everyday practices. So hopefully this will be something which is relevant and immediately implementable in our practices. So let's see here, make sure this will go through. There we go. So I don't, I have some unrelated financial disclosures as you see there. Uh, so what are objectives tonight? So today we're gonna to talk, introduce and summarize some of these recent developments in Iowa power calculations, including some new uh, methods of measuring corneal power, specifically uh, total keratometry, which is the TK value introduced on the Iowa Master 700 uh, in late 2019. We'll also talk a little bit about some new IOL power calculation formulas. There's been a plethora of formulas that have been released in the past several years, and sometimes trying to navigate through those formulas can be overwhelming and daunting. And we'll also talk about the role of these developments for corneal surgeons performing uh, cataract surgery in three specific situations. As I mentioned there, uh, combined FACO with DMEC, uh, FACO in patients with stable uh, keratoconus, and pa patients uh, after uh, uh, PKP who require cataract surgery. So we know that modern cataract surgery and virgin eyes is essentially refractive surgery. There's a plethora of new IOL, new machines, new devices. Yet even in virgin eyes, we are, if we look at the accuracy within about a half a diopter, we're clustering about 80% about with older formulas. And with Mellis in a recent uh, review in ophthalmology 2019, even the best formulas are only about 70% accurate within about three eighths of a diopter. We know things like axial length certainly plays a role, but every formula still has uh, prediction errors over a diopter. So the question is, why are we still so inaccurate even in virgin eyes? This becomes even more a problem when we talk about patients with concurrent corneal disease. And historically, the approach for corneal surgeons has kind of been, eh, kind of close enough, just be happy that you can see and, and move on and wear some glasses or contact lenses and move on with life. But can we do better? And hopefully with all of this new technology and new uh, ideas, we, we can do better. And that's what we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about today. Well, why is this so challenging? We know that measuring the power of the cornea in these eyes can be uh, inaccurate. And it's also, it's often falsely inaccurate. One of the reasons is when we do um, biometry, the, the, kerato the keratometric index, which is an assumed index of 1.3375, is itself a false and inaccurate index. We know things like the anterior versus the posterior cornea have different indices of refraction, but ultimately we're taking a measurement from the anterior corneal surface only. We are not accounting for the posterior corneal power. We're assuming that the posterior cornea has a certain power, 
But for all intents and purposes, the posterior cornea is basically like the dark side of the moon. And remember that the posterior cornea is basically a minus powered lens. Well, why is that so? If we look at a side cross-section view of the cornea, when we look at the posterior cornea, we can see here that it really is a minus powered lens. So what we're doing is we're assuming that the anterior cornea has plus power. We're assuming that the posterior cornea has a certain set value of a minus power, and we're using that to drive the total corneal power. In recent years, um, Scheinflug devices, such as the Pentacam, uh, can measure the posterior cornea, and they can generate the so-called uh, total corneal power values, and other devices, uh, such as the OrpScan and OCT-based devices, are doing this. Sounds good, right? We're, we should be measuring the posterior cornea more accurately. Uh, well, what we know is that the, the TCP values that are generated from these are typically lower. They're flatter than the K values. But the problem is, is that these values are not designed to be used with optical biometers or with um, IOL formulas that are not designed to use these particular values. So if we look at, for example, on the Pentacam, the corneal power distribution map, we can get a value which is known as the TNP or the true net power, which actually takes into account the anterior corneal index of refraction and the posterior surface index of refraction. And it uses that wonderfully disgusting equation to generate the true net power. There's also the TCRP, which uses ray tracing and uses those four different principles, which tries to give us the most realistic calculation of corneal power. But the paradox, as I mentioned, is that Iowa formulas have been calibrated historically for 1.3375, and they have impaired corrections within the formulas. So using the TNP or the TCRP would sort of unfudge the fudge factors that are inherent in the IOL formulas that are used in virgin eyes. Now, there's some potential usefulness of some of these values in LVCI. So for example, if you look at the ASCRS website, when we're trying to calculate for post-myopic LASIK, it asks for something the so-called TNP apex four millimeters on. No one ever knows where to find that. So I wanted to show that where you actually find that value is on the corneal power distribution map. You look at this thing here where that says that the true net power in the four millimeter zone, and you would enter that value on the ASCRS website and you put that into that particular box. Similarly, when we look at the, uh, uh, for patients with prior RK, it asks for this, the, the power in the central four millimeter zone. And really what it wants is the KM value here, making sure that your zone is set for four millimeters and you'd actually put that value uh, into that box over there. So that's kind of an aside, but many people, especially trainees and residents ask, well, where the heck am I supposed to find these values? That's where they find these values and has to do with the posterior cornea. Again, why does this matter? Well, if we use the TCP, the K value is falsely lower than real. And what that does is going to increase the IOL power that's calculated. And it's going to basically cause a myopic surprise, which some would basically say, well, that's basically a first world problem. And that is, uh, uh, again, fine in so-called virgin eyes. So again, the assumed measurement of the posterior cornea is based on things like the Boulstron ratio. There's other model eyes like the Lou Brennan. But the problem is that we're inaccurate, especially in steep and flat K eyes, independently and concurrently with long and short axial length eyes. And many of these eyes have corneal disease. And the problem, of course, is that we know that posterior corneal astigmatism will affect the total corneal astigmatism and the total corneal power. We think that usually it contributes against the rule of astigmatism, um, but that negative power can vary. So it either can be, uh, it can neutralize the width the rule, it can uh, uh, skew the width the rule, or it can be additive by adding uh, astigmatism to the total corneal astigmatism. In other words, the posterior corneal power does matter. So, but how the heck do we actually measure the posterior cornea? Well, we can use indirect measurements such as the nomogram, uh, such as the um, Abu Lafia Coke regression transformations, or we can let the IOL formula sort of do the work. But, uh, or we can try to directly measure the posterior cornea, as we mentioned with shine fluke devices. But one of the new developments over the past three years really has been the, the introduction of the TK on the IOL Master 700. We recently uh, published a paper looking at K versus TK. Uh, between the Abu Lafia Coke regression transformations and TK and over 10,000 eyes. And the gist of this is that it's quite possible that a regression transformation sort of over adjusts the corneal astigmatism, whereas TK more uh, accurately capture the true corneal astigmatism. And the bottom line is that the posterior cornea matters. We can't just simply assume uh, the power of the posterior cornea 
And when we do surgery that either changes the shape of the posterior cornea or in eyes that have a skewed or altered posterior corneal measurement, we have to sort of take that into consideration. So this is where the TK value comes into uh, play here. So again, the TK value is generated by the Iowa Master 700. It uses a combination of anterior K values, which is kind of what traditional keratometers did, but by using swept sort uh, OCT pachymetry to define a toric posterior surface model, we're actually able to get these posterior corneal measurements. The resulting TK value, which is again introduced in late 2019, potentially offers us a measurement of the anterior and posterior corneal radii that can be used for more accurate um, IOL calculations. And if you look at the IOL master printout, that's where that TK value will, usually now shows up sort of underneath the uh, regular K1 and K2 values. Uh, the, the beauty, at least the suggested uh, beauty of the TK values, it allows the surgeons to use um, uh, established IOL formula constants. In other words, we can use our existing IOL formulas and not have to develop new IOL formulas. For most eyes, the TK does not differ from the standard K range in, in most of the unoperated eyes, but we know that the TK and the TCA values from Pentacam are not the same or interchangeable. So we can't assume that because we're getting a Pentacam value of the TCP or the uh, or the TNP or the TCRP, that we can, uh, this is basically the same thing as the TK. This is just kind of showing us here what the uh, TK is doing, is we're getting a measurement of the anterior surface uh, uh, traditionally here, but we're using swept source OCT to measure the intracorneal distance. It creates a posterior uh, uh, torus model for the posterior cornea. It does some fancy calculations and boom, this is where we get the TK value. So now the question is, well, is TK better? Well, it kind of develop, depends on the study and what it looked at. Uh, for regular eyes, it says that basically K and TK was similar. There was a trend towards better outcome. It may work better with formulas optimized for it. When it comes with uh, presbyopia correcting owls, one paper showed it works better with toric trifocal IOLs. Uh, another one said that the regular K value is better than TK for multifocal IOLs. Uh, there's some uh, suggestion that it may help in certain post-laser vision correction, but to, for the interest of time and so we can get to what we want to talk about, we're not sure how much the TK helps and in which eyes it actually helps. So again, for normal vision eyes, for normal range axial length and normal range Ks, especially without previous laser vision correction, it probably doesn't help that much. Now, thankfully, uh, you know, so we don't have to utilize these values. Uh, if, for those of us who have access to the IOL master, the Barrett TK uh, Universal 2 formula is built in. But here you can see it's really not that much of a difference for the vast majority of eyes, maybe about a quarter diopter difference. So it's really not worth inputting the uh, TK value into online formula websites for so-called normal eyes. So again, we don't have to use TK on all eyes. So was TK useless? Does it basically have no potential? Was all this fancy technology and developments potentially, um, it, it has no potential. Well, where can TK potentially help? And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. One of the places is it can identify post laser vision correction eyes, but as far as targeting our outcomes, we think that it can help us whether we use it or don't use it in certain, in those three scenarios there. So one of the things is it can help us identify LVCI. So normally if we have laser vision correction, if we do a good history, review the medical records, do a proper exam, maybe get a topography or re review the biometry with flatter K values, especially in the presence of long axial length, we can think that this patient had previous laser vision correction, but we often may miss, vision, uh, miss patients with previous myopic laser vision correction for a variety of reasons that we see over there. So the question is, can we use TK values to detect myopic laser vision correction eyes solely using optical biometry, even if we didn't have good history? Well, one of the reasons is we know that uh, laser vision correction alters the relationship of anterior and posterior corneal radii. We can use this to calculate the APR or the PA ratio. But the uh, gist of this is that um, post myopic laser vision correction eyes are going to have lower APR and high, higher PA values respectively. And so what we sought to do was we sought to see that can we use just the TK value with the IOL master to detect myopic laser vision correction eyes and not have to use history or topography 
uh, to, det to determine with a greater than 90% uh, uh, positive predictive value whether a measured eye has previous laser vision correction. And so for this, we developed this, what we call the CRW, the cook riaz wendelstein index. That's uh, David Cook on the left and Yasha Wendelstein on the right, and no need to put my picture there. But with this index, what we did is we developed it in over 10,000 eyes uh, at Dean McGee, and then we tested it in over 40,000 eyes in six different test centers, three in the United States and three in Austria. And basically by seeing that, can we predict by the based on the measurements, whether that eye has had previous laser vision correction. And so here we see in over 38,000 eyes, we see that there's over a 93% positive predictive value that by using the CRW that we can truly identify that whether an eye has had previous laser vision correction as compared to simply looking at the uh, ratio of the posterior radius of the cornea to the anterior radius of the cornea. When we compare it to other methods, such as the Pentacam, the Galilei, even the Veracity and the Atlas, we find that it outproduced and outperformed uh, these three and performed similar to the Atlas with the uh, Pathfinder software. So basically the CRW is better than all of these uh, indices and similar to the Atlas uh, Pathfinder 2 software. So the, the point of bringing this up is that the CRW can identify uh, post myopic laser vision correction eyes effectively solely using biometry measurements, including the TK values. And why do we call it CRW1? Is we think we can also find eyes with keratoconus and fuchs simply through uh, biometry measurements. But the bottom line here is that posterior corneal measurements matter and they can help. If we shift gears here to developments in IOL formula, there's a if we break down the various uh, formulas into categories, there's thin lens, there's thick lens, there's artificial intelligence, there's ray tracing. There's probably about 24 formulas if my math is correct, but I probably missed some. If we break it down by countries of origin, we can see that this truly is an international effort across uh, international uh, borders here. And even here in the United States, many of these formulas have been developed at home. And uh, as of today, literally, a new website was launched uh, by the ESCRS. And this is the um, IOL calculator at the ESCRS website. It's kind of like the ASCRS post refractive surgery website. And the idea is by having one IOL power calculator, we can rule them all rather than having to go to a million different websites. And here's what that website looks like. So it actually allows us to side by side compare seven different formulas by measuring the biometric values for a single patient. So kind of like a kayak.com, we can get multiple side-by-side -side comparison of seven different formulas. So this is literally hot off the press because it was just launched today. And this is a great resource rather than having to put in uh, manually put in, in, in information into a million different websites. So if we shift gears here now to the three areas that we as corneal surgeons may frequently encounter. So the first scenario is very common, is how do we calculate the IOL power when we want to do combined FACO DMEC? Well, the question is, can we use the TK value to help us? Well, there's a tendency, as we very well know, that there's a more than intended hyperopic refractive outcome. And this is primarily due to alterations of the posterior corneal curvature, as well as the corneal thickness from the corneal edema, which basically leads to inaccurate corneal measurements due to this corneal pathology. Previously, we kind of relied on adjustment factors, such as targeting additional myopia for about minus a Set minus 0.75 to minus one to kind of compensate and sort of hope and wish and pray that we hit um, emetropia. So what we wanted, what we sought to do is we sought to study whether using K or TK values with a given formula would lead to more accurate refractive results. So this is a study here of, of 83 eyes that underwent FACO DMEC with, um, you know, after the introduction of TK. We studied nine different formulas, as you can see there. Um, and, and most of those are, um, and five of those, uh, excuse me, are multivariable formulas, the Barrett, the Evo, the K6, the Kane, and the Pearl. And the four of them are third generation, Holiday One, Hopper, Q, SRKT, and Hagus, and using both K and TK values. So we inputted the uh, biometric values in using both the K and TK values into online formulas. And formulas were additionally tested by internally increasing the IOL formula, formula uh, IOL power, excuse me, by one diopter. The refractions were done within 30 to 120 days. And here's sort of the results that we saw there. That in other words, uh, weirdly enough, all nine formulas are better than K 
uh, are better with K than with TK. And I'll explain why that probably is. We found lower um, prediction errors with multivariable formulas, as well as good old SRKT using the regular uh, K values there. And interestingly enough, the Barrett TK, despite its potential usefulness in virginize, actually was one of the worst multivariable formulas, kind of uh, bringing up the rear all the way down here with Hopper, uh, Q, and, and Hagus. The other thing we did was rather than target minus seven, five or minus one, we thought, well, if we adjusted the IOL power by one diopter, how would we actually function? And here are our results. And we can see that these uh, uh, patients did a little bit better than the previous slide. So for example, if we said the K6 formula for that a 21 diopter IOL for patient about to undergo phacodemic would give approximately point, uh, negative 0 0.5 diopter spherical equivalent, instead of kind of targeting to see what would cause minus 0.75 or uh, minus one, we said, well, all you need to do is just increase that power by one diopter. So in other words, rather than using the 21, if we used a 22, this would give us a better chance of hitting the desired refraction of minus a half. As far as a practical tip, the SRKT and the Barrett uh, Universal 2 with K appear on the Iowa Master printout, as well as the Lenstar printout, I guess, without requiring manual input of biometric data into the online calculators. And again, notice here that Hoffer and Hagus uh, sort of bring up the rear here, showing that these older generation formulas uh, really don't perform as well as we thought they did in previous yesteryears. Well, why did TK perform so badly in this cohort of patients? Well, if you look at the normal cornea, uh, that's, that's uh, the shape over here. When we have an edematous cornea like with Fuchs, we have posterior flattening and so the anterior K, anterior cornea, gives a less negative than expected value. So in other words, the measured uh, PK value, the posterior corneal value, falsely skews the generated TK values. In other words, after DMEC, the posterior corneal steepening that, that occurs uh, uh, will, will cause the preoperative TK value to actually be inaccurate. So in other words, it's sort of better to remain ignorant of the power of the posterior cornea in these phaco DMAC eyes. And now there's some studies that are currently being under, undertaken to predict the post-operative post corneal flattening to improve IOL power calculations in these eyes. So the summary is that yes, the, the, the accuracy is very challenging, but the prediction accuracy of K is still better than that of TK. In other words, don't use TK when we are performing uh, FACO DMEC eyes. The multivariable formulas, excluding Barrett, uh, you know, uh, are, are the most accurate if we just use, if we don't use the IOL one diopter up adjustment. But the best and the most practical thing that we could do is to use the IOL power one diopter adjustment and use the generated printout with Barrett or SRKT, which again, uh, is generated by the biometry printout, and therefore we can save some time and effort by having to go to manual uh, online-only calculators. If we shift gears here to IOL power calculations in keratoconus eyes. So we know that these eyes, the corneal power is often overestimated, and the IOL power therefore is falsely lower than required, and basically we get a hyperopic surprise. We also know that the ELP tends to be more posterior than actual, and that leads to a hyperopic shift. Well, why does that happen? Well, the Goulstrand ratio between the anterior and posterior cornea is altered in these eyes, especially with increasing uh, disease severity. So the question is, since we're not changing the cornea in these eyes, unlike like, uh, compared to phaco DMEC, can the TK value improve the prediction in these keratoconic eyes? So this is a study that we did with, uh, with Baskin Palmer. It's a two-center study with 87 keratoconus eyes, keratoconus eyes. We studied 13 different formulas, three of them which were uh, keratoconus specific. They're the Barrett Universal with the keratoconus measured posterior corneal astigmatism, as well as the predicted and the cane keratoconus formula. Uh, five multivariable formulas, four third generation formulas, as you can see there, and one third generation with the Pentacam values, which is the Holiday One using the EKR65, which has been advocated by some authorities as a good measurement. So really the question is, is it better to use a keratoconus specific formula that internally and mathematically adjusts for the altered corneal power in keratoconus eyes? In other words, should we let the formula do the work or should we use 
potentially more accurate corneal power values, which such as the EKR and TK, which incorporate the posterior corneal power to improve the performance of non keratoconus specific formulas. And this is what we found, is we found that the three keratoconus specific formulas actually had the lowest refractive, uh, the mean uh, the prediction errors compared to non keratoconus, uh, keratoconus formulas. In other words, there's a minimal need for myopic targeting. Nearly all formulas, interestingly enough, performed better with TK compared to K. The top performing multivariable formulas such as Evo and Kane and uh, Cook and Barrett uh, performed similarly, but still had a slightly hyperopic uh, prediction error, suggesting that we still need to target some myopia. Also interesting is that multivariable formulas outperformed third generation formulas. However, good old SRKT still did pretty good among the third generation formulas. When we look at the eyes that only had the EKR, we can see the EKR, weirdly enough, had actually the lowest uh, prediction error, excuse me, I jumped ahead there, had the lowest prediction error, but it had the highest uh, variation. So in other words, it's kind of like a wild card. Some eyes did very well, but some of them had very bad prediction errors. And when we looked at the Friedman ANOVA to compare formula head-to-head -head comparison, we see that the Barrett and the Barrett, the Barrett KCN and the EVO formulas did much better than the Holiday One with the EKR. So this time we don't recommend using the Holiday One with EKR method, especially when we have these keratoconus formulas, uh, keratoconus specific formulas that are available. When we further broke down those eyes into patients with at least one steep meridian greater than 50 diopters, we saw that the keratoconus specific formulas did very well and good old SRKT did very well, whether we used TK or K, and finally, multivariable formulas with TK also did well. In other words, the TK value did help, especially the more severe diseased eye that we saw. When we looked at the keratoconus eyes with both corneal meridians less than 50 diopters, what's interesting is that the keratoconus specific formulas don't do as well. Perhaps they over adjust, they overcompensate, and these less diseased eyes are more similar to kind of normal eyes. So in here, we saw that the multivariable formula, such as the Evo and the Kane, did very well, whether we use the TK or the K, even though the TK still did very well. However, the SRKT did not do very well. So in other words, the SRKT works really well in extreme keratoconus eyes, but doesn't do too well in sort of mild to moderate keratoconus uh, type of eye. So here's sort of the summary. The Barrett KCN, especially with uh, the measured predicted corneal astigmatism, performed well in all subgroups and didn't appear to require additional myopic targeting. Um, if we broke the eyes down into severe keratoconus, the keratoconus formulas and the SRKT performed the best. In non-severe keratoconus eyes, several multivariable formulas, especially those that use TK values, can be uh, effectively used, but you still have to do some slight myopic targeting. But most importantly, uh, please don't use these third generation formulas uh, like the Hopper and the Holiday One or Hagus for these eyes. These are the equivalent, in my opinion, uh, like flip phones. It's, tried, it's time to put them away and, uh, and really not use them for these uh, extremely diseased eyes. I wanted to uh, take a little aside here to show how to use these particular formulas, especially uh, younger uh, trainees and uh, residents often ask this. So if we go to the Kane website, the, there's the link there, iolformula.com, uh, making sure that we click on this keratoconus box here in the arrow before we put our measurements in. This allows the formula to kind of shift into keratoconus mode and, um, you know, and make the necessary uh, magical adjustments internally that that formula does. So I just wanted to show that make sure that we click on the keratoconus uh, option there when running this formula. The Barrett website here requires a little bit of explanation. It's very confusing. First of all, it doesn't come up on a Google search. You get a different True K website. So you actually got to go to this website link here, and you got to make sure it says uh, the Barrett True K formula for prior myopic or hyperopic LASIK PRK RK plus KC, right? So you know, keratoconus. You'd think maybe they, they would have done a better job in sort of uh, labeling this. And making sure that we uh, go down here to this box, because it gives you an option for myopic LASIK, hyperopic LASIK, RK, and keratoconus, and making sure that the keratoconus option is selected. So that's something that's important. 
And here is sort of a, a patient that I did recently. I just changed the name to Mickey Mouse, but these are actually real measurements. So I was doing the left eye. So here we see, uh, you know, a relatively, you know, 50.8, 41. So this is a very steep uh, cornea with, with, with um, uh, very similar to what you would see with keratoconus measurements. So when we put these values in and we hit calculate, we click on this box here that says calculate, what ends up happening is it generates these two boxes. It says predicted PCA or measured PCA. In other words, uh, predicted PCA is basically, are we going to let the formula do the work? Because we've just fed it regular K values. We've not fed it any TK values. And that probably works just fine. But as we saw in the study, the measured PCA actually works. So if we just did predicted PCA, hit calculate, and then hit universal formula, we'll get a Iowa power calculation uh, that'll be generated and will actually say the predicted PCA. In other words, the formula has done the work to try to predict the posterior corneal astigmatism. And now it has generated an IOL here, like a 20.5, which it thinks will give us approximately a minus 0.8. But what the Barrett formula wants uh, for the keratoconus formula is if we want to use the TK, it actually, even though it says TK, it doesn't want you to put in the TK in that particular place. It actually wants you to uh, put in the so-called uh, PK value, which you kind of have to actually scroll down on your biometry printout and find this PK1 and PK2 value. You would input it here now for this left eye in, in the screen when it actually says for the predicted uh, uh, PCA, excuse me, the measured PCA. Also make sure that you uh, uh, click on this box here and actually select the Iowa Master 700 TK keratoconus option. So you got to click on that in order to get, you can notice here, you could also put in posterior corneal power from the Pentacam and, and use that accordingly there. But we're just going to show how to do it here. Now, the other weird website nuance is even though I only care about this left eye, I'm not doing surgery on the right eye, I have to put in some measurements, some values over here. So you have to put some measurements for the, po for the uh, posterior cornea of the non-operating eye, even if it's fake numbers, otherwise it won't run. We notified Graham Barrett about this back in April of 2022 when we were doing this study, and they still haven't fixed it. So I just wanted you all to know that this is a weird nuance of this particular website, that even though you're only calculating for the left eye, you still have to put in some dummy values for the right eye, otherwise the formula won't run. So then when we hit calculate, we get a new IOL power calculation that's done. And notice the box now has changed to say the measured PCA. And so for this patient, all we did was by putting in the PK values, the, uh, uh, the IOL power for the predicted uh, PCA was 20.5. And for now for the measured was 19.5. So suggesting that we can actually use this 19.5 rather than a 20.5, the 20.5 may have actually led us to be more myopic than intended, which again, some may argue is not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're trying to get them as accurate as possible, the measured PCA value is a new tool in our tool belt that we can use for those patients who are desiring to be as close to emetropia as possible. So uh, I thought that that would be useful to kind of show how to use that website because it's not very user-friendly and people talk about using it, but no one really actually explains how to use it. So hopefully uh, that little uh, screenshot explanation shows you how to uh, actually use it. We'll wrap up here with our third category, which is IOL power calculations and post PKPIs. And this can be commonly encountered, especially if we've had to do a, a, a corneal transplant for uh, in, you know, infection or inflammation. And we can often get a rapidly developing cataract that we have to do cataract surgery. And so can we uh, improve our outcomes in these eyes? So we know that the power calculations remain very challenging. The uh, uh, corneal measurements are inaccurate. There can be significant and or irregular astigmatism. And there oftentimes may still, still be some corneal pathology like a scar or significant haze. There's a scarcity in the literature of guidelines regarding formula choice in these eyes. And most, form most surgeons kind of just use uh, their usual formulas and just kind of target uh, additional myopia. And the question that we sought to study was, since the corneal measurements in these eyes are often inaccurate, does using TK values improve refractive accuracy? 
So again, small numbers, but you know these don't come up that often. And so in really in the past two years, we only had 13 eyes that met the inclusion criteria of having 2040 vision or better. And here's kind of what the results showed is we when we used only the K values in these 13 eyes, and we looked at both some of the, the multivariable formulas and the uh, uh, third generation formulas, we can see that there's almost a uh, universal tendency towards hyperopic outcomes other than the SRKT, which still tends to miss myopic. And this has been shown in eyes with steep Ks, uh, the, the SRKT uh, serendipitously sort of ends up a little bit more myopic. So it kind of compensates. So it's like using a uh, steering wheel of a car that's uh, the wheels are aimed towards the left. So if you just now turn the wheel to the right, you'll end up kind of going straight on the road. So, but again, has a low uh, MAE, which shows that you can have a high variation in, in the results. But again, we can see that the multivariable formulas did slightly better than the uh, um, uh, third generation formulas when we used only K values. Then we thought, well, what if we feed these formulas, the, uh, the TK values, would it improve their outcomes? And we can see here again, it helped a little bit, but not dramatically. So only 40% of the eyes were within a half a diopter. That So the TK values helped slightly. Uh, interestingly, though, many of the newer multivariable formulas could not run all the eyes, such as the Hill RBF and even Kane. Uh, they kind of wouldn't run all of the eyes. And we noticed that even with the Keratoconus project, one of the reasons we didn't include Hill in that was because Hill didn't really uh, run all of the eyes. And when we look at side by side and we rank them by root mean square, we can see that, again, the TK values it helped some of the formulas perform a little bit better. But again, it's not some, nothing to write home about that, oh my gosh, you have to use the TK value. So basically, uh, again, if you have the TK value available in these eyes, you can use a formula like K6 or some of the other formulas to slightly improve performance. But again, these are uh, eyes that remain challenging. Uh, and so you know, we can't really promise these patients that they're gonna end up uh, similar to virgin eyes. So in conclusion, the summary recommendations for IOL power calculations and eyes with corneal disease. What we showed here is that the posterior corneal measurements can help in select cases. So for example, it can help find myopic laser vision correction eyes like I showed with the CRW1 uh, index. But when we're planning to do surgery, such as with FACO DMEC eyes, do not use the TK values. It's better to use the regular K values and increase the IOL power by one diopter more than what you want to achieve. And you can use a printout value such as a printout formula such as SRKT or Barrett Universal and still accomplish a pretty or, or hit your target with a fair amount of accuracy. When we're talking about keratoconus eyes, the Barrett Universal 2 uh, uh, keratoconus formula with the measured PCA did best across the board but it does require some time and effort to go to the online calculator and kind of uh, you know, put in the regular K values then find the PK values and put those in. But uh, again, if, if for those surgeons who are interested in trying to uh, achieve um, excellent targets, it may be worth the time and effort. If one of the Ks is greater than 50 diopters, the keratoconus specific formulas, whether we gave them uh, regular K or TK, works the best. And again, the SRKT formula serendipitously works well when the K is great, when at least one K is greater than 50 diopters. However, if both the Ks are less than 50 diopters, multivariable formulas using the TK did better than even uh, than, than using the, the K and the KCN specific formulas in the SRKT actually didn't do as well when the uh, K value is greater than 50 diopters. Again, we think that perhaps these formulas do too extreme of an adjustment that is that the adjustment really works when you have a very severely diseased eye, but when you have a moderate disease eye, then simply using the uh, multivariable formula and the TK value uh, uh, would, would work just fine. And finally, in post PKP eyes, uh, the TK, it helped a little bit, but not too much. But more importantly, the multivariable formulas did much better 
uh, than the older uh, formula. So that is sort of a summary, a one slide recommendation summary of the past 40 minutes of kind of what we uh, talked about. Finally, uh, a shameless plug here. Uh, uh, just uh, last week, we published our long awaited uh, optics for the new millennium textbook. This is a uh, available on Springer, uh, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Google Play. And, and really it's a three part book that has all the optics that's needed for written exams, oral boards and clinical practice, as well as surgical optics. And some of the stuff we talked about, about IOL power calculations in corneal disease and post LASIK and all of that sort of included there. So we hope it's something uh, that people will uh, value. And uh, it, as you can see there, uh, the forward is written by Doug Koch. So we think that's a pretty legit uh, endorsement. So anyway, thank you for your time. Those are my kids. And if there's any questions, uh, comments, uh, critiques, happy to uh, respond to them in the time that we have left. So thank you once again for joining us on a Thursday night. And hopefully some of the information that I shared uh, is useful and immediately implementable uh, in your refractive, in, in your uh, respective practices. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rios. That was lovely. Um, we have one comment so far, which is an excellent presentation. Uh, lots of very useful info from Dr. Omar at University Hospitals. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Sometimes it takes a minute after the end of the presentation um, for people to type them in. I can very go back to the summary slide. Let me go back to the summary slide, which if you, you know, like I said, this is going to be um, uh, obviously available as a recording, but if anyone wants to just screenshot that, I mean, I don't mind. That's basically the summary of my entire 40-minute uh, presentation there. So uh, I'll just leave it there so that way people can look at it. But if there's any other questions, comments, happy to answer them at this time. It doesn't look like anybody has anything so far. I think uh, I wonder if anybody will type anything in or maybe you left them speechless and included all of the relevant or, uh, information. Or people are just getting ready for th Thursday night football, probably. And they're just like, when's this thing going to wrap up so I can go watch some football? That's actually a good point. Um, I don't even know who's playing tonight. Um, uh, all right, Kansas, well. Kansas City and San Diego. Uh, Kansas City and San Diego. Well, that's always fun to watch Patrick Mahomes, right? Um, so I think um, if nobody has any questions, I think that's it. And we'll wrap it up for the night. Um, I just want to say thanks again to Dr. Riaz um, for the talk. It's a really great topic. Um, and I really appreciated your um, attention to detail um, and obvious uh, care and curiosity um, on this topic. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, anything you want to say in closing, Dr. Riaz? Um, no, um, I, my, my email was on the first slide. If anybody wants to send any questions, happy to answer it there. And uh, thank you to Michael and, and, and all the folks at Eversight for uh, uh, you know, inviting me to speak on this topic. It's a pleasure to to join you all and uh, certainly have a very soft spot in my heart for Eversight for all that they do. I've known them since I was a resident and, uh, uh, you know, they they do a lot of good work. So they haven't uh, asked me to do this, but I just wanted to plug Eversight, and, you know, keep up the great work. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, it looks like that's all we have for tonight. So um, we'll see you all in Chicago um, for World Cornea Congress, American Academy of Ophthalmology, and the Cornea and Eye Banking Forum. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all next month for Dr. Montenegro's talk on uh, Desaic uh, in the glaucoma patient. Uh, and I hope everybody has a great night and enjoys the football game. Bye. Thank you all.